Live from the Moscone Convention Center in San Francisco, California, it's The Cube at Oracle Open World 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsor, Cisco Systems, with support from NetApp. And now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Frick. Okay, hello everyone, welcome back. We're live here in San Francisco, California, Moscone Center, where Oracle has taken over downtown San Francisco. Of course, the Cube has taken over the Cisco booth, and we are here live, thanks to Cisco Intel NetApp. Uh, the Cube's here, we have two Cubes, our fifth year covering it. We're also over on the Cube Logic with Dave uh, Vellante and Stu Miniman. Uh, love to have two Cubes, it means double the action, double the fun. I'm John Furrier, the co-founder of SiliconANGLE Medium, here with Jeff Frick, my co-host. Harry, Howie Shu, Senior Director of Cisco Cloud Networking and Services Group, is back on theCUBE, great to see you again. Thank you for inviting me. So I love the fact that we're in the Cisco booth, because one, I'm a big fan of Cisco, big franchise, obviously they made the internet, TCP IP, networking, routers, edge routers, we'll come back to that term in a second. We talk about disruptive technology, what that edge means, but um, networking obviously is in wheelhouse, Cisco's wheelhouse. Great market, great activity, a lot of change happening, a lot of people going, finally, some good stuff happening in the network, intelligence, and obviously the apps are driving it. So I want to get your, your take on a couple things. One, um, cloud is now legit, because Larry says it's legit, so you know, <laughs> you know that's, that's one, one comment. Um, and the joke we were seeing on theCUBE is, if he just called network computing cloud, it would have been successful back in the day. So I've been joking about the, his early venture with terminals or basically dumb clients, if you will, or see, mobile devices. Uh, so get your take on the current cloud situation. Obviously we talked about intercloud earlier yesterday here at Cisco, your, your new uh, foray. What's going on with cloud and why is the networking piece still the most important discussion item in cloud? Well, you know, this, is, this um, talk is actually at the right timing. Cisco actually announced a number of new things with intercloud yesterday by Rob Lloyd and the other senior executives. In particular, there are a number of products I actually I am responsible for intercloud fabric. The idea here is if you ask any CIOs today that, okay, do you want to go cloud? The answer is absolutely, I want to go as fast as possible uh, for many of them. But then you turn around, you talk to a CSO, and the CSO is going to tell you, no, slow down, you know. <laughs> I, I lose the visibility, I lose the control, I lose the uh, compliance and the security stuff. So that's the fundamental issue that cloud era you know, is at today. Now, intercloud fabric and the Cisco's take is, you don't have to compromise. We give you a fabric, we give you that intercloud technology, so that you, you can actually go to a um, CIO who wanted to go cloud and go hybrid cloud, we give you the technology so that the, you still retain the compliance, security, and the control, and the visibility. And without the vendor locking, because you can move your workload to one public cloud, and you can move back when you want, and you can move to another public cloud. So the idea Cisco is pushing for is really the intercloud notion that you know, one cloud is, has its limitation. It's the ecosystem of the cloud. It's very much like the ISP for the internet. Yeah, I mean, the play on words, internetworking, which may, was the mega trend that really made Cisco, and 3Com for that matter, when they were still around, made the networking business. I mean, back in the day, internetworking was all about sharing across different networks. Here, it's interesting. It's clouds, which is a combination of networks and other stuff. So, so talk about the other stuff, because it's not just networks anymore, there's other parts of the inner cloud. You've got virtualization, you've got application-specific workload requirements, a lot of policy. <laughs> How complicated is it? And, and what did you guys do in inner cloud that make it easy for customers? That's a good question. The reason, there is a reason we call it intercloud fabric and not intercloud the networking fabric, because it's way beyond the networking. Sure, you need to give people the same networking primitives or the security or the compliance, but then when you move workloads around, it's also about the storage. You, know, you have to move the storage along with you. If you don't, then your performance sucks. And then you also have the interdependency of different applications, figuring out what is the sort of the cluster of the application. Should you move together? If you move one, one or two components, is that going to you know, um, compromise in the performance? So it's, it's actually very complicated stuff. So I call it somewhat rocky science stuff. Yeah, so also let's tie into some of the things that we're seeing, obviously with Oracle the past few years, engineered systems. We've seen things like VBLOCK. We've seen things like uh, FlexPod come out. These are engineered systems, if you will. They're, they're essentially high-end converged infrastructure uh, platforms that have been tailor-made. So it seems to be that the trend is towards engineered 
solutions per se, I don't want to use the word engineer so in quotes, but like, you're seeing like, let's just say Goldman Sachs is a big company, might have a requirement for certain utility uh, in the network and the applications for transactions, okay, real time or something of that nature. That might be a great blueprint for something else. So, so what do you guys do to enable a customer, so they're not fearful, because the fear is, well if I'm using the inner clouds, and stuff moves around, how do I know it's baked? How do I know that the environment's baked out in a way that's going to support it, hit my SLAs, if it's real time, I need performance, I need late, low latency. All these things are kind of the FUD and the, the cognitive dissonance that they might have after they go there. Yeah, I think you touched upon a very important part. It's not just the technology, it's the solution that matters. When I talked about the CIOs wanted to go to cloud because they heard all day long that cloud has this benefit, has that benefit, but that's a lot of that is just technology. What it comes down to is, you know, what is the security and the compliance and how easy to, to get it going. CIOs want something that it just works, it's just a plug and a play. If, if you look at some of the open source projects, some of them are very successful, some of them are less successful. They are less successful because people paid attention to the technology piece, less to the turnkey solution piece. If you look at a Cisco yeah. as a company, uh, we are delivering not just the, the technology, but also the solution. So you bring this up, this, this is kind of the speeds and feeds we always say, hey, if this port has X number of ports and they're certainly fast, yes, yes. that's the old way. The new way is business outcomes. I mean, it sounds like a cliche term, but at the end of the day, the investment's going into specific managed business outcomes. So with that in mind, how does InterCloud play into it? Because now, uh, do you certify clouds? Is NFV involved? What are some of the things in InterCloud could fabric? Can you share some, some, some data? One, do you certify? And does NFV have anything to do with this? Well, all of the above, but let's, let's sort of decompose this a little bit. InterCloud, first and foremost, it's actually a collection of the clouds. Um, there are participants like BT, Telstra from you know, outside the US and inside the US, there are also partners uh, to work, working together. It's kind of uh, important because a lot of the countries or the shops, they are very much geo-sensitive, where the data is, where the application is. So that's why we are, in, we are cooperating with lots of uh, service providers around the world. So that's one part. Well, and that, that criteria about localization is twofold, performance for the user experience and also compliance, right? Compliance. I would say compliance trumps everything else at this point yeah. of the game. Um, now, and then you said this NFV stuff, but NFV is a means to an end. To your point, the business outcome is what's more important. Yeah. So what is the business? To service providers, providing networking as a service, uh, you know, a utility networking services, that's what they want. For, that's for the service providers. For the enterprise guys, I just want to make sure when I move the workload from A to B, I enjoy the same security mechanism, I enjoy the same compliance, and then you have to provision, you have to deploy the networking uh, on demand. Oftentimes you need NFV to help. So NFV is there in the picture, but it's a means to an end. Okay, so I got to ask you about uh, SDN. So SDN, since Nasira went to VMware, it seems like a decade ago, my God, it's a long time. Th what, th th two years ago now, full two years? I mean, dog years, what do you want to call it? I mean, but a lot's changed. How has SDN changed? Certainly this, this past year at VMworld, uh, Martin was on theCUBE, and he said there was a watershed moment this year in SDN, that finally the dam has broke, that was his quote, about customer adoption. It's kind of in this phase of, is it real? What's happening? What's your take on that? I think for VMware specific, I cannot comment on the B VMware's business because uh, I don't have a lot of insights, but um, I want to say that what VMware's message, NSX message, uh, resonates well with customer today is actually a technology that has been there for you know, more than 10 years. Uh, Mendo actually uh, did a talk on this east-west traffic security you know, more than 10 years ago. But security is actually getting uh, more and more sort of attention, right, because of all the things yeah. going on. And uh, so when you talk about this networking on demand going this and that, for enterprise guys, um, as a turnkey solution, it's not quite ready. However, one thing they, it's sort of addressing their fear or uncertainty or you know, the third part is the security part. We, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you that, okay, you have lots of virtualized server and the east-west traffic is not quite there. That sort of you know, immediately raised the attention so that that's why NSX is getting some traction in this east-west security business. And so NXS aside for Martins, I mean, obviously he has his you know, thing to do with there because he got bought out, but in general, SDN, how would you give it a grade? Doing well, A, B, C, you know, B minus, A plus? It's interesting, on. you actually asked this question to Steve Harrow, the then C CTO of VMware about two or three years ago. I believe uh, Steve gave 
uh, computing virtualization as A grade, and then storage um, close to A, and then uh, networking virtualization C plus. I want to say we are still at a B ish grade. The reason is, if you look at the virtualization, computing virtualization is mature. Storage virtualization, you look at Oracle world, you look at VM world, it's all about storage virtualization. If you look at a 20 solution for networking virtualization, it's still limited. Of course, Cisco has its own solution, which is the ACI, application um, based sort of networking. And the idea is having um, admins or the networking guys managing one network, overlay and underlay together. VMware is more pushing towards the direction that I have an overlay and then managing overlay only, but then you, since you cannot fire any networking guys managing underlay, you still have to have a different set of people managing the old, old underlay. So in that case, you have two networks. That's additional complexity. Yeah. Cisco's messages, I give you one solution. And one you guys will manage the overlay and the underlay in yes. one product. Yes. Okay, cool. That, well, that makes a lot of sense on coordination. How does the um, uh, UCS fit into that? Because one of the things we've heard from your customers is um, the service profile has been an interesting thing. One of the customers actually called it the soul of the network comes out of the box and can be moved across the network. How does that relate to all this? So if I, if I just uh, go back to the history, why virtualization was interesting to the enterprise? Because I'm managing all the virtual entities. It's flexible, it's sort of easy to manage, the provision speed, all of that is cool. So what happens is people look at the virtualization world and they look, okay, physical world. Why physical world is so inflexible, so clumsy? So the first thing Cisco did it was, okay, let me look at the servers. Why server provisioning is so, so difficult? Because you still manage server like a brick. It's not intelligent. Now I give you the profile. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I give you all yeah. the intelligent tools. So now you manage servers, the bare metal servers. Management becomes a lot easier. So that's one thing Cisco did. So what ACI does is they essentially apply the similar model to the physical network. We used to be very clumsy, slow. Now I give you the intelligence, I give you application awareness, I give you this profile-based management, policy-based management. So the idea is the bare metal servers, bare metal networking, and then in the future bare metal storage is going to be a very flexible. So what's it, if it's a brick before, what is it now? Well, UCS, <laughs> UCS grew from nowhere uh, five years ago to this is you know number one in uh, U.S. play market for uh, for good reason, which is um, the way you manage UCS is a very different, a very yeah. different level from the way you managed in the past. Yeah, in the past, I mean, the brick analogy really good it means it's a dumb, dumb, dumb uh, box. But back then, you had to hardwire, you know, local networks, configuration management, all kinds of management it was very difficult, and that was just physically. Now you had virtualization. Okay, so let's take it to the next level. Disrupt technology, so I got this network that's smart, got some agile capabilities, adaptive, whatever buzzword we want to use, but essentially flexible. So now you get the cloud comes in, now you got application developers, DevOps, pushing down saying, I want to dictate to the infrastructure how to behave based on the workload or the application, but I'm a developer, I'm not a networking guy. So that's DevOps, that's infrastructure as code. What is the thing that you see happening most important in this infrastructure as code movement? Where the app developers want to provision, they want dynamic, they want policy-based fill in the blank for all aspects. Well, so the analogy I give you, uh, virtualization actually uh, looked at how clumsy, how inefficient the physical world was, and then took advantage of it, and then created an industry, virtualization um, industry, right? Now people look at the virtualization industry, just like uh, we looked at the, the industry about 15 years ago. Actually, virtualization create, you know, brings a lot of fat, a lot of inefficiency in there. Now how do I go 10x efficient, more efficient, 10x more uh, provision uh, speed or agile? So the container technology is obviously, you know, a lot of people are talking about it. When you look deep, um, I looked at the container technology, not just the Docker. Docker is great. As a great company, they just raised a huge amount of money. But I looked at it as fundamentally, what is the management unit? 15 years ago, the management unit is the physical machine. That was inefficient. And then we bring to the virtual machine, and then that becomes the management unit. Now, next five, 10 years, the management unit seems to me that should be the application directly. I went to VMworld, uh, the CTO did a, a, a keynote speech. The, the, uh, in his keynote speech, he said, well, do you really want to manage thousands of Linux threads? Um, that's unmanageable. 
Yeah. I agree and I disagree with him. I agree with him that today, with today's technology, it's not manageable. But I think this is where the container is going to lead us to. If container world is going to give us the framework, just like a world virtualization, VMware did to the, the, the physical world, it gave us the framework so that we can manage threads, manage application at scale, you know, in a manageable way, give you the life cycle management. At that point, you, can, you cannot argue this is actually, you know, all the magnitude of more um, efficient technology at that point. I mean, the computer science um, innovation is interesting. If you take a container, it's got traction as an interoperable unit for the apps. You can write to it, the developer community has traction with the way they wrote their, their uh, open source piece of it, the way the contribution works. You could, all, you could almost bolt on a compiler to the container. You could bolt on other intelligence to manage things as complex as threads. So that's what you're saying, right? Yes, and, and at that point, once you have that technology, at that point you look at a hypervisor. Hypervisor is actually in the way. The reason is, today what do you do when you, whenever you provision a virtual machine? You say, I give you eight gig memory, I give you 20 gig disk. But look at enterprise applications. What's the last time you really have an application, really need eight gig memory, 20 gig disk space, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, seven days a week, you know, 365 days. Yeah, eight cores, add, no, add some cores on there, there too, There's eight no cores. way you need that many resources all the time on the, on the lasting basis. When you go to the application level, container level, you are actually scheduling things at a much finer granule granular level, and then that's where the efficiency comes from. Well, it's interesting, you mentioned threading, so I, I would maybe tap into the multi-core and memory if I have a specific app that was threading, multi-threads all over the place at full peak. But what's interesting about virtualization in the cloud, you move, can move resources around, right? So this is an interesting dynamic, so. And so the other thing is, one of the key problems uh, virtualization industry addressed was a multi-core thing. When you, when you had a, a Intel released the multi-core and then uh, Windows, Linux at the time couldn't quite take advantage of the 16 core, how many cores, the virtualization actually addressed the issue. But now the problem space actually moved because application actually sometimes needs thousands of cores at a one time at a scale out way. Virtualization doesn't quite bring that benefit and then we're, that's where the thread level schedule actually makes sense. Okay, well we love the container technology. Obviously I want to get you a question. I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Steve Herod at VMworld since you brought up Steve Herod, which is a great friend of ours. We love Steve. Always great guest, like yourself on theCUBE, very and a, candid. And a great mentor of myself. His, has he been? Oh, yes. awesome. he's fantastic. So yeah, he's done good. I love Steve. Good karma. Uh, he lives in the karma world. Hi Steve, if you're watching, uh, we want you back on theCUBE. You owe me <laughs> coffee at the new place with the whiteboard uh, at uh, General <laughs> Catalyst. Um, okay, so the question I want you to talk, I want you to comment on three bullets. Um, we're living in a multi-cloud world with infrastructure for mobile and perimeterless IT. Um, this is a conversation we talked to Steve about it at VMworld. Comment about that. What does multi-cloud world mean? What does infrastructure for mobile mean? And what does perimeterless IT mean? Per per perimeterless IT. So first, first and foremost, remember 15 years ago for, for things like for, for events like this, what do we talk? We talk about CPU speed, we talk about that. And today we talk about cloud and mobile. And um, I think you know, it's just uh, the same Moore's law, it's just a different magnification. Manif um, Moore's law was sort of, you know, people look at the Moore's law by the CPU speed and the things like that. Today people look at it by cloud, by the mobile. So I think it's the same stuff. Now back to the, your question, uh, multi-cloud. Today, like I said, early on, people have a genuine problem. The genuine problem with the cloud is that um, there, is a, there is a vendor locking. If I move to some of the public cloud, you know, how can you move application back? Um, how can you give the enterprise level of the uh, security and the compliance um, primitives. So that's where the multi-cloud come into play. You have the flexibility, you have the hybrid in this, you have the vendor choice. So that's one thing. That's, and also, that's also where inter-cloud might fit in for you guys. Yes, inter-cloud fits perfectly well and then that's exactly why Cisco's motivation to address this. Just like Cisco solved the problem of inter-networking, now Cisco wanted to solve this inter-cloud problem. So that's number one. Mobile. Mobile, it's just uh, the way people consume technologies in a very different way. Before it's the PC or whatnot, now it's the you know, iPhone. Um, it's just a different way to consume the technology. What's important here is, a lot of the enterprise guys, they spend a lot of time in the last 15 years configuring CLI. 
and then they look at their iPhone, and then they are, they're looking at the user interface. Inevitably, they would go back to vendors like Cisco and then say, how, can, how come I don't have an iPhone-like interface when I configure switch in the routers? How can I, this is a very much policy-based. How can I just uh, configure switch in the router as easy as... And the as horsepower's not uh, that much on the iPhone, even though it's getting more and more. <laughs> so you might have a master-slave architecture, the compute might be different, the low yeah. latency, real-time data. Yeah, <laughs> so a lot of people talk about the mobile things, and the key point I wanted to raise is that kind of user experience is actually feeding back to the enterprise. Now, enterprise guys are asking companies like HP, Cisco, or Intel, hey, you know, whatever the technology, uh, you need to give me iPhone-like uh, user experience. That's an actually very profound change. I'm seeing that firsthand yeah. for my own product, for my own team, you know, I need to get my team to sort of develop a product, <laughs> not just for CCIE PhDs, but also for <laughs> iPhone <laughs> generation. Yeah. So the last thing is the, um, the, the, the sort of the security or whatnot without permit. That's actually very much because of the virtualization, because of the cloud. Before you have a choke point, you can say, I put my switch, I, I can put my firewall right here, and then I configure the policies. But these days, because of the devices, mobile yeah. devices, because of the APIs, virtual machine move around, APIs. because of the uh, containers moving between different clouds, I mean, it's very hard for you to find that choke point, let alone having a choke point that, that technology that really scaled at the first place. Okay, great, so, so apps driving the future, multi-cloud, okay, um, IT perimeter, less uh, security, because that's the reality. Where does that leave uh, the customer right now? In your mind, so, you, so what you're developing and what the customer's doing, tie that together. For the customer watching out there, Cisco customer or IT buyer or just an enterprise who's got a business objective, What's the, what, what do they do? What, what's your advice to them right now? How do, they, how do they handle all this? What do they do? Is there a roadmap? Is there a playbook? So for the IT guys, one of the things they are paying attention to is they are looking for the uh, turnkey solution, not just technologies. If you look at a white, why cloud is thriving today. Cloud concept or utility computing concept was, was there 10, 15 years ago. And then you probably have you know, talked about utility computing even back in the last you know, two uh, recessions ago. Why cloud is thriving today? That's precisely because the cloud, the data center technology gets more and more complex. The networking, storage, sure, virtualization makes things a lot more flexible, brings you a lot of more efficiencies, but at the same time, virtualization also brings the complexity into the picture. Right. Yeah. That's what I also view that, you know, well, virtualization solves the problem is the Microsoft thing, which is the efficiency issue. But, but the virtualization also brings, uh, you know, one pinpoint, the key pinpoint to the data center, which is because of the virtualization, very hard to keep track of things, very hard to measure things. So the complexity is just, uh, you know, incredible. Because of that, people said, well, you know, I'm not going to do anything. I just go to public cloud because these guys are going to manage resource for me. I'm just pay as you go. And at that point, Point, cloud gets so much momentum. Of course, at the same time, like I said, the CSO is saying, no, 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 slow down. <laughs> yes, you can go to public cloud, but the security and the compliance problem is not completely resolved. So that's why, you know, cloud is getting momentum. However, the problem is still yet to be solved. And you think containers are going to be a good thing or just ho-hum? What there do you are think two, about two that? things. First, I would preface with any question, question like this with, with one standard answer. A lot of that has to do with execution because no matter how promising a technology is, if you don't do enough about it, then you are not going to take key advantage of it. We're at an Oracle world. Actually, some microsystem, um, in some ways, um, had this container technology many, many years ago, <laughs> but they didn't take this to the next level, right? So just because the container has the potential, that doesn't mean it will be there. So that's number one. Number two, can container actually get to the next level? I think it has a great chance. Um, it does have a chance to disrupt the industry, disrupt the virtualization world, disrupt the, 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 the world that people look at everything like a VM, now people would go back and maybe I should look at everything like an application. Yeah, and also you can do, potentially do more. So it's all about the momentum. If it kind of flattens out and there's no adoption, it needs critical mass, I guess what you're saying, right? Yes, you I need mean, to get over the hump. Containers I, have been around, wrappers been around for a long time, gateways, whatever you want to call it. Okay, great, so final, final question to wrap, I'll give you the final word here. Um, what's, what's the most exciting thing happening in Oracle Open World from your standpoint that 
that validates some of the things that you've been working on? I think the most exciting thing is this, this interview, because this interview is at the same time as Larry, Larry's keynote speech. The fact I'm doing this at, at the same time as Larry, that means <laughs> you, know, you are talking about multi-cloud, inter-cloud, container. That means there is so much um, real attention and a real traction with this. That's the and you got 1,400 concurrent viewers right now, so actually, I'd be curious to find out how many concurrent viewers Larry Ellison has. So it might be that you're pulling a bigger audience than Larry Ellison. <laughs> we'll see. So we'll see. Howie Shu, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Great to hear it. Again, we love to geek out. Networking is really important. The applications are in charge. Computer science and some of the networking engineering stuff is really, really awesome right now. A lot more innovation going on. Uh, thanks for sharing. And again, great to, to bring up Steve Harrod, uh, your mentor and good friend of ours and uh, now a venture capitalist. So, so uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see how that turns out. But it'll still, he should do well. Good luck. Uh, good luck. <laughs> Good luck, Steve. We, love, we miss you. Come back on theCUBE anytime. We are live in San Francisco. We'll be right back after this short break. This is theCUBE. I'm John with Jeff Frick.